Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our FMX Solutions webinar, Getting Started with Atlassian Intelligence and Jira Service Management. I'm Kinsey, the Marketing Manager with FMX. Thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Kevin Patterson, an ITSM ESM Solution Consultant with us at FMX Solutions. Kevin, it's off to you. Thank you very much, Kinsey. Let's start today by first talking about our agenda. We're going to talk today and, and again with an introduction as well as a poll question to get us started. From there, we're going to talk about what is Atlassian intelligence and most importantly, how it can add value for your organization. Now, once we've talked about that, we'll kind of get you started on the right path. We'll tell you where to get started to start actualizing value with this technology. We'll do a quick Q&A session and then final words and takeaways. So before I really get going, I just want to take a few moments and tell you, you know, about FMX Solutions. So for those that are just meeting us for the first time, we're an Atlassian Gold Partner with a laser focused on ITSM and ESM solutions. We have offices across North America and both US and Canada. You'll find when working with FMX, we have a very deep knowledge of ITSM best practices, and that includes ITIL v4 as well as some legacy ITIL v3 when required. Now, we have this because we have a 14-year background of ITSM expertise. We've been doing this for over a decade. All of our consultants are ITIL certified and live and breathe ITSM. Now, the cornerstone of FMX Solutions is to deliver the best-in-class services and solutions with our customers, employees, and partner success in mind at all times. So looking forward to spending the next uh, 40 minutes with you all. So sit back and uh, enjoy the presentation. I'm going to pass it over to Kinsey for a moment for a quick audience poll. Kinsey, over to you. Yes, so you should all see the poll showing up now. It's, have you participated in the Atlassian Intelligence Beta or EAP programs? And your answers are yes, no, and I didn't know it was available in beta. Okay, we'll give you all a few moments to populate that poll with your response. We're getting quite a few yeses, Kevin. Oh, and one I didn't know was available in, be in beta. Well, you're in for a treat. All right, so let's go ahead and continue on. We'll definitely uh, talk about this a bit more throughout today's session and presentation. So let's move on to uh, what is Atlassian Intelligence for, for those of you that might not be aware of what this technology is. So for some background, Atlassian's been working tirelessly over the last couple of years to provide AI capabilities on their cloud platform. Now, that work was made available very recently via the Early Access Program, and it's been called Atlassian Intelligence. Now, Atlassian Intelligence leverages artificial intelligence developed both internally and from OpenAI. Uh, so they acquired Precept AI, I believe about 18 months ago, and are working with, with that set of technology as well as some custom built Atlassian technology and also taking advantage of the OpenAI stack to bring you what you're about to see for their Atlassian Intelligence. Now, it uses what Atlassian refers to as their teamwork graph, which is a, a unique to your team's projects and service work, along with the Atlassian internal language model, along with OpenAI to deliver those results. So just as with everything Atlassian does, existing privacy and security standards and company values apply to Atlassian intelligence as well. So Atlassian has created a set of principles to guide their teams when building, developing, and using new technologies like artificial intelligence. Now, to learn more about their approach, I've asked Kinsey to link to their responsible technologies principle documentation in the chat, so you can all take a look and review uh, at, at your leisure. I think it's very important to see the, the care Atlassian takes with your data. Uh, they're one of the few companies that really keep that front in their minds when they're working on these cloud types of technologies with, with AI from what I've seen today. So now we talked about what it is. I want to talk to you about how you can use Atlassian Intelligence to help you and your organization. So for, I, I've been doing ITSM for a little over 20 years myself. Uh, before I was an ITSM consultant, I too was in operations. So I know what it's like to have work coming at you from all angles. You know, both my phones ringing, cell phone, landline back then, emails, uh, the ITSM tool, tickets coming in there, and then I called them drive-bys. People coming to my desk, you know, throwing work on my plate there. So there is never a shortage of things that need to get done. Now here's where Atlassian intelligence can really start helping you very quickly. 
uh, it can take away some of that um, mundane repetitive tasks you might have to do as part of your role. So for instance, uh, if I'm maybe on a service desk and I want to provide good resolution notes or good information in, in the ticket, uh, in the old days, I'd have to manually type and then proofread it before I submitted. Whereas now there's some features in Elastic Intelligence that can really help me uh, get better content into my tickets as an agent. Now, looking at this from an end user lens, we're going to talk about their virtual agent. This is really going to help accelerate your shift left, being able to take things that used to be on a human's plate and moving them on to technology's plate to help solve issues without engaging your staff in IT for very repetitive things like helping them find the right documentation or putting a request in for a new laptop or for troubleshooting a, a very simple issue with a VPN or maybe two-factor authentication. These are all great examples of how you can use Atlassian Intelligence to help you in your organization as you take on this journey. Now, we're gonna look at a few key features today of Elastian Intelligence. They're really focused on Jira service management. Uh, now, there's other features available for tools like Confluence and Jira software, but today I, I really want to focus in on how it can help your ITSM experience and ESM experience in Jira service management. So uh, today there's going to be four key areas you can take advantage of, and then coming very soon, a fifth area to take advantage of. So let's talk about those briefly now. The first is generate new content. So you're going to find that Lasting Intelligence is going to help you, as I mentioned earlier, be able to keep better information in your tickets as you're inputting them. So it's going to help guide your submissions. It'll actually shrink or maybe even limit the amount of text you put in a description that's more succinct. It can even help you change the tone of your response. Perhaps it's known in the organization that some of my uh, messages are very stabby. I'm kind of pokey. Well, I can summarize or I can use the generate new content and take it from being pokey to being maybe a little softer, a bit more professional, all the click of a button. So it really does help with generating that new content. Something I use today and I've been using since the early access came out is the summarization of existing content. So you're going to find, and you probably already know that when you're working on your, your major incidents or problems or your change requests, that that job log can get pretty long. Wouldn't it be great if I could jump into an issue, hit a button, and just see a brief summary of everything that's happened up till now? That's going to save me minutes of my day each and every time I go into an issue. Now, doesn't sound like a big deal until you realize that I look at 80 tickets a day and then those minutes become hours. More importantly, if it's a major incident, time is of the essence. So now you're gonna be able to be up to speed very quickly and not spend the first five minutes of reading the incident trying to figure out what was already done. So summarization is really key there. Now, why most of you probably came today was to see the virtual agent and how that might be able to help you. So yes, we're gonna talk about that virtual agent and I'll even do some demonstration around that to see how you might be using that virtual agent to get some value out of Atlassian Analytics and Atlassian Intelligence very quickly. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Atlassian Answers as it pertains to the virtual agent. Uh, just from my own experience, this is probably one of the most exciting things for me, seeing how Atlassian Answers can really help get me the information I need very quickly with minimal configuration, with the asterisk there being that you've got a working knowledge base with good content. We're going to talk about that throughout today's presentation. And then the last point here, which isn't here today, but it's coming very soon, is the natural language driven JQL. Now, many of you old time Jira people can probably write JQL in your sleep, but those of you that are newer to the Elastian platform might struggle a bit as you're writing your JQL queries. So very soon, Elastian Intelligence and Elastian Natural Language is going to allow you to have whatever you write in, in English or Spanish or French, whatever your language is in natural language, to create the JQL query for you. Now, last thing, well, let me tell you when it's coming, but I'll tell you this, that you should probably attend that event that's happening in Amsterdam virtually because they might have a date for you there. So um, definitely be looking for Atlassian to communicate when this is released because it is coming very, very soon. Now, we've talked a bit about what we're gonna cover. Let's do a, a quick live demonstration. Now, this first demonstration is gonna be very quick. I wanna show you how the summarizations and generate content works with Atlassian intelligence here. So let's change over to my browser. Um, so what I want to do here is to show you a few of those features in one of my demo environments. And we're going to start with this open incident. I've got an open incident uh, right now for a orders are getting duplicated. Let's go ahead and drill in here and see what Elastian Intelligence looks like uh, in real life. 
so here we can kind of see the ticket. We see the it is a major incident. I can see I can see the summary and all the details about this particular ticket, including the normal things we talk about in a demo, like the responders and the, ch and the Slack channel capturing all the swarming that's happening. But what I want to show you if we go down a bit further is down in the comments. And the first is to summarize. So as you can see, there's probably lots and lots of things that have happened throughout the life cycle of this. Wouldn't it be great if I could hit one button and see a summary of all that work in one place? In fact, I can. One click brings me just what I need to know. Hey, Kevin, orders are getting duplicated. IT ops is on it. Uh, Lana reported the issue and has duplicate orders somewhere else, and it looks like it's been escalated to a major incident. So what it's doing here is it's kind of giving me a, kind of a bird's eye view of what's going on without spending time going through every single comment of this particular issue. Now, of course, it wants feedback and it uses feedback to know if it's helpful or not. This is really going to help improve that language model. So I always give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down if I found it helpful. Uh, for me, that was helpful, so I will give that a, a thumbs up in our presentation here. So down here, I've got an internal note I'm about to add because I'll be honest, if we look at the, um, the related incidents here, we can see that this issue happens quite a bit. We've actually had the same issue happen four or five times over the last couple of weeks. You see my comment here internally. It can be seen as a bit stabby, right? It's very, very urgent. You know, that's not a very business way to write this comment, but luckily for me, I can go over here and I can say, you know what, change the tone of this. Maybe make it more empathetic, make it more professional. And at last, scene intelligence is going to go through and say, you know what, let's clean this up a bit and change it to this. And it lets me proofread this. And I can even say, insert it or replace my previous. I'm going to replace my previous so I can put this in. And it makes me look like a professional writer there, right? So again, very quick examples of how this can be utilized. In fact, a couple other things I want to show you is some other things you can do. Uh, you can actually use this to fix your spelling and grammar. Uh, you can even brainstorm your response. Uh, for some of my team members here, they're quite wordy. I would encourage them to uh, make shorter. When they've got nine paragraphs, that could be one paragraph. Make shorter is a great way as you're going through. You can really clean that up and make it a bit easier. So from an agent's perspective, this generative AI is helping quite a bit with the summarization and the generation of content for our issues. Now, it's not just for your typical agent. I'm seeing these features all over the platform, including for the, uh, the administrators as well. If we look over here, administrators are constantly adding new request types in their service catalog. Well, now with Atlassian Intelligence, there's the ability to have the um, model help you suggest what you should be doing. In fact, you know, I want to have a way for users to um, maybe submit a request for getting a new Jira project. So something many of you might struggle with where you have maybe an email inbox set up to you where people send you emails, say, I need a new Jira project. Wouldn't it be great if we could have a service offering in our catalog to do that? And here is it suggesting what it should look like. So it's giving me the details here. I can select that, hit create, and it starts creating that service request for me. It's already pre-classified it as a service request, so it's understanding my context. It gives me the option to tweak my name, my description, and even add a better icon here before I get that into my service catalog. And in fact, I'm gonna add that to my common requests, and we'll go ahead and hit create and get that into my service catalog. So that's a very brief demonstration of some of the things that it can do from a content creation and summarization standpoint. Now let's go on and kind of review that, right? So again, when you think of content creation, think about brainstorming your ideas, think about fixing your speller and grammar, condensing, making things shorter, and most importantly for me, changing the tone. And when you think about the summarization, just remember that one button you can click to be able to summarize things that are happening in your environment. When it comes to your comments or your history, you can even summarize knowledge articles, even help write knowledge articles with this technology. So a lot of really cool things can be done there with the summarization and generation of content on that platform. Now let's move on to the virtual agent. So what I love about the virtual agent, what I've been seeing from some of the customers that I've worked with to date is um, they're really thinking outside of the box. They've realized that it doesn't just have to be for IT, right? So this can really be used to ask 
whatever question, whenever or wherever the user is at, whether it's you know, maybe it's on my, my laptop or my mobile device, as long as I have access to a channel like Slack or Teams, I'm able to chat like I normally would and ask my question. So really, this virtual agent is a game changer for what organizations are going to be able to do when it comes to shifting left and taking some of the burden off of an individual that might have to answer these questions. So let's go back over to the environment and I'll give you a live demonstration of what the virtual agent and answers can do for you and your organization before we talk about what you can do to get started with this technology. So let's move over to what I'm using here is Slack. So I've got a couple different demo environments set up. Um, we'll use Slack for today's presentation. So what I've done here is I've created a Slack channel called IT support that I've linked to my service desk project. So this is gonna allow me to intake uh, chats from my user community. They can be both answered by a virtual agent or be passed over to a human uh, if, if that requires that level of escalation. So the example I wanted to show you today is help with two-factor authentication. Now, like me, I'm sure most of you probably um, you know, use 2FA many times per day as you're logging into various systems. Um, you know, mine usually works pretty well. I'd say once or twice a month, it gets a little, uh, little dicey for my phone, but, um, but it works pretty well overall. But what if I, I'm a user that's not very technically savvy and I need help? Well, this should be a, a great first stop for me. So let's go ahead and put this in. So you see you know, Kevin Patterson has submitted it and we're already seeing some replies coming in. And hey, it looks like it's coming from the virtual agent. Uh, it's basically introducing itself. And by the way, you have full control over this. We'll talk about this a bit later. And what it's doing is it's doing some work in the background. It's trying to match the intent. So it's looking at saying, hey, based on this, I think you're wanting help in this area. And it, it, it asked me for a yes or no here. If I say no, it goes back and looks again. If I say yes, it goes down that path and starts trying to help me solve my issues. So I'm going to hit yes here. So if I go ahead and hit yes, it's going to ask me a few questions. It's going to say, okay, what are you using for two-factor authentication? Well, we support a couple different tools at my organization for 2FA. Uh, the two primary ones being uh, Microsoft Authenticator but, and Duo, but we have other tools we can support, and maybe there should be an option for I haven't installed one yet. So we'll talk about this later, but you've got the ability to kind of create these flows that can capture whatever information you need to either have the agent respond better or collect information for the, from the, for the ticket for the, for the human to respond with. So for me, I'm going to select Microsoft Authenticator because that's what I'm using today for my authentication. So here's what it's doing. It's going to say, okay, please review the documentation to ensure that it's set up correctly. So what I'll do is I'll click this hyperlink here it brings me over to a new tab so I can review this. I can go through line by line. I can see my knowledge base. I go through and you know what? I went through it. Mine looks to be set up the same way. So I don't think this is going to help me. So I can go back here and I can say, hey, did this article help? I'm going to give this some feedback and I'm going to say no. Unfortunately, it did not. Let's see what the agent does here, right? So there's doing some things in the background here. It says synchronizing with JIRA. So what it's doing is it's taking the information from our little chat session there, and it's creating a JSM ticket in my ITS project. That's my service desk project. There I can see that it's um, got a ticket number is ITS 3568. Let's go ahead and click over there and see what that looks like. So here we see from an end user's point of view, the details that we show in the activity is everything from that chat log, but I can also see some other key information. I can see that the status is open. I can see the request offering type. I can even share this with others in my organization. And of course, I can also collect information from the user. I can give them the ability to cancel if maybe they figured it out themselves and I wanna cancel this so a person doesn't email me or call me, I hit that button and it closes the ticket for, for me without any other action. So very quick and easy to do. But on the back end, here we can actually go through and see the ticket itself that the agent would be responding to, right? So I can start to see some of those details. I also see some of that information. In fact, I can even put comments in here. I can add reply to customer that would send information right back to that chat session while also keeping it in JSM. So that's an example of how you can use the, the virtual agent to deflect some of those technical issues. Now, let's take a quick look at some of the, the setup information that might be required there, right? So if we go over here, here's the agent view for the administrator. So the administrator actually set that up in this JSM project. 
Uh, if you go look at the virtual agent settings in your environment, you're going to notice you're going to land on a page called intents. Now, the one we just happened to use was two factor authentication. So if we come over here to two factor authentication, I can show you how I set this up. So once the intent has been matched based on that keyword matching and the, uh, the large language model going through and figuring out where it should match, it's going to kick off this flow. It's going to offer me choices. Those choices were configured by me, the administrator of these different offerings, Authenticator, Duo, Other, or I have not installed one yet. If we scroll to the left here, we'll see that Microsoft Authenticator. Here's where we can see that flow, what it looks like, and how it's different from the Duo flow, the Other flow, as well as the I haven't installed one yet. So really, it's kind of a fork in the road that defines what happens next in that end user experience and or whether or not it was um, successful in resolving the issue. If we go down a bit further, kind of want to show you here the choices it offered, right? So um, when it gave me that knowledge article, this is what the prompts were, yes or no. And again, you've got full control on how you, how you want to ask this. You just have to define it inside of your intents and your flows here to make sure it's aligned with the experience you want to give your end user. Now, had I said yes, it was going to resolve this and give the, uh, the the virtual agent credit for that win from, an, from a reporting standpoint. Now, the fact that I said no, what it did is it kicked off a request inside of JSM. In fact, it not only let me fill out the request, but I can provide additional fields. In fact, I can go through here and I can actually update fields. So I went ahead and updated the field for uh, the field we're used to capture the, the application that's impacted and put the value Microsoft Authenticator in there so it can be properly classified when it comes to the agent. Because, hey, maybe different agents support one tool like Authenticator and other agents supports Duo. This will let you route based on the need at the time. So a great set of features to have as part of your, um, your virtual agent. Now, going down a bit, there's some standard flows you'll be able to configure. The greeting, hey, what does it say when I first jump in to greet? Again, you've got um, full control over what that says. Same with escalate, resolve, match intent, and then auto close. So right now you can't define your own standard flows. These are gonna come from Atlassian, but you'll be able to manipulate and modify these in your environment. Now that's one part of the virtual agent, but I wanna show you a second part of the virtual agent. And this ties back to a feature inside of this called Atlassian answers or Atlassian intelligence answers. So I want to show you how this works first before I, I talk about it further. Now, inside of another project I have for marketing, I've got a, a queue set up called Marketing Help here. Now, this is not an IT team. This is the marketing team. So they don't really have the um, bandwidth to go in and create those intent flows uh, like, like I did for that um, two-factor authentication. But what the marketing team does have is a good, solid knowledge base foundation. So. I can leverage that when I use the virtual agent to respond to people putting queries into this channel. So for instance, uh, you know, I'm working, I work with our marketing coordinator, Kinsey, to build a presentation today, but I need to know a, a key bit of information about this to make my, my slides look just right. I need to know the color code for our FMX logo, the actual you know, hexadecimal code we use to be able to get that right shade of color. Now check this out. I can actually come here to my my channel as a typical end user that might want to, to know this information, I can say, um, I need to know what the orange branding color code is to use in a presentation. And just like that, I can submit that into my marketing channel. Uh, it takes a little longer sometimes because it's searching the knowledge base, but here we see a few different examples as it comes in. And this is what I love, right? So it's gone ahead and not only given me the answer to it, uh, which happens to be F47COO, but it gives me the reasons why it's picking this. And it lets me interrogate that just to make sure in case I'm skeptical. So if I look at one of these articles by clicking, we can see that this information actually lives inside of the marketing team's knowledge base. So if you've got a good solid foundation from a knowledge management perspective, just turning on the answers alone is going to give you quick value to get the right information to your agents here. Now, if I say this solved my issue, which it in fact did, I can hit yes, and it's going to ask me for some feedback. It's like, hey, would you mind reading my service? I'm going to say yes, because they are using this to provide 
uh, reporting to me as an admin. So I get better ideas of how the users feel about these flows and how they feel about the virtual agent itself. Lower scores can help me know to go in and tweak some of the ways that I ask questions. So at a very high level, that's what you can expect from your virtual agent. You can build your own custom flows to go down certain paths and ask specific questions, or you can leverage at last seen answers here to be able to use your knowledge bases to be able to provide the right level of content, look at your requesters. So let's go back and talk about this again, right? But I now want to talk about it more in your context, especially for those of you that have not started setting this up in your own environments or your sandboxes yet. So when doing this, I'm a techie myself, so I fall victim to it. A lot of us like to jump right into step four here and start hammering on that keyboard and configuring a virtual agent with things off the top of our head. You know, you can do that, but that's not a great way to actualize value quickly. So what I've done is put together a few steps we feel are going to help you be most effective that we use ourselves when we work with clients to be able to configure this application. So the first step on your journey to levering, leveraging Elastic Intelligence should be, to me, a knowledge management assessment. So here, we'll, we'll talk to you about more steps later on, but just know you should be looking for where your knowledge is, how it's being used, and a few other key points we'll talk about in just a few minutes. Once you've done that, I encourage you to analyze your data, not just your knowledge base, but your ITSM tool, which is probably Jira Service Management, and see where things are coming in and analyze that. We'll talk about that more in a few minutes as well. Once you've done those two things, now it's time to um, you know, put on your hat and get to work and start curating content. And that might be you creating some content as a knowledge manager, or it could be you working with your teams of subject matter experts to build knowledge as well. Now, if any of you on the call follow a KCS yes philosophy of, of knowledge management, um, you're in a great place here because you've already curated a lot of great content in the context of your users to be able to be actualizing value here much, much quicker. And we'll talk about that a bit later as well. And then once you've done those three things, that's when we start doing the agent configuration. We'll go through leveraging that We'll start building those intents, building those flows, taking advantage of what's going to help you get value quickly. And then it's a matter of going live and, and then evolving it over time. You know, once you go live, you don't just you know, walk away. Like anything in your ITSM solution, you're going to want to make sure it's up to date. You'll want to make sure that you're building your request types, you're, built, you're keeping the flows updated. Um, depending on how you're doing knowledge, the knowledge is updated. So there's more to do than just turning the switch and going live. There's some care and feeding you should consider doing longer term. But let's, over the next few minutes, go a bit deeper in each one of these steps so you know where I'm coming from. So let's first tackle that knowledge management assessment. So one of the first things I'm encouraging you to do is to really identify and review systems in place supporting your knowledge practice across your whole organization, not just IT. So like I was showing earlier, it wasn't just the IT support chat that was happening. There was that marketing chat, but we're seeing it go to IT, marketing, HR. I've even seen a legal use case here as well. So you're going to find that it's not just an IT thing. It's going to be a business thing. This virtual agent can be used across the Atlassian platform uh, to really support any business unit that's doing work across uh, JSM with a decent knowledge base. So you want to go through and find these pockets of knowledge. And honestly, some of these things might not even be in Confluence. They could be in SharePoint. They could be in a, in a wiki somewhere that's hosted locally. So you really want to go through and identify what you have so you can start where you are. Um, so and then identify your your methodologies used by different teams. You know, uh, in a perfect world, you know, the IT team and everyone's using a, a KCS type of approach where we're solving and evolving. We're constantly curating information and the user's context and, and using knowledge to really help drive our support practices. But for those that aren't, it's good to understand how different teams treat knowledge. Some it might be a person's role, like in IT, I've seen it very common to have a knowledge manager, but I'll, I'll guarantee you that most organizations, there's not a, a, a marketing knowledge manager or a, an HR knowledge manager. It could just be a, a collaboration of many people to make sure the knowledge base is updated, right? So you wanna really understand how knowledge is being used across your organization. So I encourage that to be your first step to take along this journey of, of turning on your virtual agent and getting it going. Now, once you've done that, this is where we start analyzing your data. You know, I'm here to tell you there, there's no uh, silver bullet, just a lot of lead bullets here, right? So the virtual agent turning it on day one is not going to shift left 95% of your support work. 
you know, it's not here to really replace agents per se, but just take some of the burden off the agents. So this step, analyze your data, is meant to go through looking through reporting to see you know, what channels are being used today. Because let's face it, if they're calling your service desk today or they're just emailing today, there's going to be some OCM, organizational change management, to change that to get them to want to use that channel, right? So we need to understand what channels things are coming in to see what our expectations should be and what the effort's going to be to get our users to shift to a different mode of communication with the service desk or with the business teams. So I also look at what articles today, if there are any, how effective are they at deflecting issues today? If you're using the, the, the portal in JSM, you're able to collect these metrics to see how many times the article was successful, right? So I use this to kind of help guide where I start focusing my efforts first. So for instance, I told you 95% it shift left is probably not going to happen, but I do feel that 20% is in the realm of possibility. So how I do that is I pick candidates that are good candidates to go through and to be built out in my virtual agent for flows. So when I identify that, I typically take about 15 to 30 use cases and I build those and then I, I use them for about a month to see where they're at. And I, if they're working, leave them as is. If they're not, I'll tweak it to see if I can find value there. But I can only pick the right ones by analyzing the data. So certain things are conducive to being done by a virtual agent, like providing information or collecting details for a request. You know, some things are not yet, right? So some things are still gonna require that human touch that a virtual agent's just not going to be able to have. So uh, I try to limit my focus to just the ones that I think the virtual agent has a good chance of solving. And again, that just comes down to experience and me analyzing data. But I suspect for those of you that have been running an ITSM tool for a while, you could even look at the reports and know what to pick. And if not, FMX is here to give you a hand with that, that assessment if you need us. So once you've done those two things, you might start finding gaps of, hey, we're we're not quite there yet with the knowledge that we have. And this is where it starts getting a little tougher. You, you've got to go through and you got to curate that content. So, you know, content could be external to Elastian. It might be internal, but not formatted right. So you need to work with your teams to kind of wrangle this content and bring it to a place where the, the virtual agent can access that, especially for the Elastian answers. Now, those logic flows that I was showing you earlier can, in fact, relate out to uh, external sources. So fret not if your documentation is in SharePoint and you build one of those flows, you can easily link to SharePoint and it's not going to be an issue for you. But if you want to take advantage of that Elastian Answers feature, it must be in Confluence right now to be able to, to match that. So again, content curation, one of the hardest things I've seen organizations do because it, it's not really someone's core job. So you're going to really have to work to build a kind of a team to help go out and build this content and find the right level of information to put in these documents. Often an area I see overlooked here is the content in the user's terms. You know, being an IT guy myself, when I write knowledge articles, sometimes I'm very rigid. And that's all technical terms. But you really need to use the user's context and their vernacular for how they communicate issues with these tools because they might have shorthand they use for applications and things like that that might not exist in a large language model Atlassian is using. So you'll want to train your model to be doing some of this stuff. So again, this all comes down to your content curation. So uh, one of the harder steps you'll, you'll find when you're going through this process. Now, I'll be honest with you, the, one of the easiest things is actually configuring the virtual agent. So going through creating the intents, all user driven, there's no coding required. I can go through here and create my um, my user intents. I can do the training by putting in some of the, um, the, the either keywords or sentences or utterances that they might encounter. And that along with the, the open AI and language model last thing user uses will be able to give the right um, mapping to the right intent. So again, the configuration of the agent is what I was showing you in the demo. Very easy, very simple, and you do get basic metrics from that as well. So um, virtual agent configuration, I'm least worried about you, you tackling because it is very straightforward and simple to do. Uh, I have put a link up here to the steps because there are a few steps you've got to do to turn it on. Uh, I didn't have time to walk you through every single setting, but you'll need to uh, map it to a Slack channel or a Teams channel, and you'll need to add a few other things in there as well. Uh, all very simple, takes about five minutes to get it set up if you're an Elastian administrator. So again, very quick and easy to, to set up there. 
And then lastly here on my on my my chart was to go live and evolve, you know, go live, you know, have it have it be your cake day, right? This is your opportunity to turn this on and to start, you know, seeing what's working. And then most importantly, evolving it over time. You know, don't just turn it on and walk away. The have somebody responsible for checking in on the metrics coming back. You know, seeing what the users say. Was it getting one star or five star reviews? Check in on that experience. See how many times these things have been solved. Uh, so again, go live and evolution is going to be, in my mind, one and the same because we're constantly adding new content, going live with that content. This should be a living system that's part of your ITSM practice when it comes to your, your JSM tool. So go live and evolve. Now there's one critical component I haven't talked to. I mentioned it briefly, but I haven't really spent a lot of time on, but that's the, the people. Uh, don't overlook the people, your end users, your business users, right? Um, this is not that Kevin Costner movie, Field of Dreams, where if you build it, they will come. They probably won't know about it, right? This is where your OCM practice, organizational change management can really help you. If you've got one, I've got a team that does that, work with them to define your communication plans, uh, how you're, you're gonna roll this out. If you don't have a team specialized in that, FMX Solutions can help you here as well. We have a practice on OCM that can help you with your comm plans, your communications, uh, what, how to structure this information. That's all part of our package. You'd be able to leverage us for that as well. But most importantly, don't just build it and assume everybody's going to use it because they have to know about it. And getting the word out uh, can be done in many, many ways. And it's a constant flow of data at different time periods before you go live to get them ready for this change. Otherwise, you're setting yourself up for disappointment when only 10 people use it the first week. You really want to get better adoption. Uh, and you know, I, I'll leave it at that. I can't get preached to, but running, running a bit short on time. So we'll, we'll keep uh, going forward here. And this is really your time now. So I've talked a bit about technology. I showed you where I feel JSM is going to take advantage of Atlassian intelligence. We looked at the summarization, generating content. We looked at the virtual agent. And then my favorite, the answers component. Uh, but now I want to hear your questions and how I might be able to help you or point you in the right direction for getting started in your environment. So, uh, Kenzie, I think you were monitoring our, our our chat for me. Do we have any questions yes, coming so in? We have three questions here that have been asked. And then if anybody else has more, you can use the Q&A function at the top of the Teams webinar there and enter it, and I'll be able to see them pop up. Uh, so, Kevin, our first question is I manage two JSM projects that are used by our service desk. I do not see the settings under administration to turn on these features. We have JSM premium. Is this only available for enterprise licenses? OK, so no, it's available on the premium tier as well. So I, I don't think that's why you're not seeing it. So the first thing you need to do is enroll in the program. So um, I'll try to find you a link here, um, but I can tell you that You've got it when you activate it, it's through your admin.atlassian.com. And I'm going from memory. When you go to products, there's going to be a setting for Atlassian intelligence. So you'll be able to go there and you first have to turn this feature on. Now, once it's done at the platform level, you as a um, administrator of your project or projects in your case, uh, would be able to go through and take advantage of those settings that I was showing you in the demonstration. So if you're a global admin with that, that privilege, you can turn it on yourself. If not, you want to coordinate with the sysadmin to go through and turn in that product on globally. But no, it's it's available at your tier. It's not an enterprise thing. Elasio wants this to be for a lot of their customers. So it's 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 not locked down to just enterprise. Uh, but great question. Thanks, thanks for asking that one. Um, Kenzie, yeah, is, uh, you said there was two more? Yep, there are two more. Um, is there a built-in mechanism to report on usage or deflection of issues that the chatbot solves? Um, absolutely there is. In fact, shame on me. I don't think I did. I pointed it out as I was doing the demonstration. So let's go back to my page there that actually had the configuration, which I believe was here. It's right now it's locked away on the intents page. So you'll be able to kind of see um, some basic metrics here on what's going in. You'll be able to see conversations, uh, how many match, match meaning how many uh, those intents match and 80% match and then 20% resolution and then your CSAT score average here. So uh, you'll be able to see that here on the screen. 
I believe this information is going to be filtered up when they go live to reports as well. But for right now, I'm getting all of my information from this particular view. So you'll be able to kind of see the basics here. Uh, the big things I look for is your um, uh, your match rate. Again, I'm in a, in a demo environment, so the match rate is going to be quite high, and uh, most of my things are in test, very few are live. Uh, but uh, I will tell you that don't be discouraged when you see your match rates being lower. Um, honestly, match rates that are you know, 40, 50 percent aren't bad. Um, resolution rates that are over 20 percent, in my opinion, aren't bad either. I mean, you might want a higher number and you can probably get there, but don't don't get discouraged. This is a journey, right? And then, of course, that CSAT score. It's great that we're getting these results, but we want to do it in a way where we still keep the, the end user or a business user satisfied. So keep an eye on that star. If you start to see it dropping from like fives to fours to threes, look and see and maybe even do some some survey monkey type surveys to see how folks are are liking the technology because there might be no issues with with the technology itself but how you're asking the questions you might want to reconsider those standard flows for greetings and escalations and things like that so um long way to say go here for your your metrics and analytics right now but longer term i expect these to be reports you can run once they they make this uh, available in production so um so yeah um Kinsey, what's the, the next question that we, we have there from the audience? Um, well, we actually just had a new one come in, and it's using Atlassian AI to assess risk on change requests and to accept and or reject CI slash CD deployment steps. Is this a totally another webinar? Uh, it is, yeah. So we are to be able to do a few other key things for, for change management. They are improving the language models quite a bit. Uh, this is more of a, a getting started with the uh, technology quickly. We can definitely do more sessions once it becomes generally available to all customers to to get to that value for sure. Yep. So uh, uh, stay tuned for that. We'll probably do webinar in the next uh, probably two or three months to go a bit deeper down this rabbit hole uh, based on the features that are launched at go live. Great. And then we have one more. Um, we probably will not start to build out intents and flows until Q2 of next year. But our knowledge base is over 500 articles today. Is there anything special we must do with the Confluence space used for our knowledge base? Um, special, um, not not only special, but you just uh, for this to work, you've got to associate the Confluence space you're using for knowledge to your JSM project that's being tied to that that request channel. So that's the the first thing I would check if you're if you're going to go through and do that. Um, I think 500 articles isn't bad. I, I don't know. Who asked it? But um, I, I would encourage you to still go through the steps of kind of looking at that content, making sure that um, it is for, for purpose and up to date because you don't want to go live with 500 articles, as you say, if there's some some incorrect information. Maybe there's uh, something that's out of date or just some policy has changed. I, I would encourage you to still go through the exercise there. But no, I think 500 um, is not bad. I think. Uh, you know, most organizations when I when I look at when I start working with them, it's in the it's in the low hundreds. So five hundred is a great start. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing how you like this when you turn this on in production. I think you said next year. So uh, hopefully you find uh, quick value as you start working with that technology. I just know that I'm rooting for you, and and my team's here to help you if you run into any um, any issues with this technology. Kinsey, we have any more questions coming in? Uh, we have one. When is this expected to be GA? <laughs> um, I I so I used to work for it last year, year ago, but uh, I don't have a crystal ball anymore, so I don't have the exact an answer for you. Um, there that there's an event happening next week in Amsterdam. I don't know for sure, but I suspect they're going to announce some very important things there. Um, I would be looking for that date at that event. That's why I'm attending virtually, just so I know what it is. So I'd encourage you to uh, to sign up for it. And I, I'm drawing a blank on the name of the event. I think it's Atlassian. It's a DevOps event. I believe it's called, I almost called it Ingest, but I think it's in something. But um, uh, hop on the Atlassian website and do a, do a quick search. I'm sure you'll find it. But be at that event virtually next week in Amsterdam. You'll be able to probably find out some great information on, on when this is going to be live. I can't promise they're going to announce it, but I, I heard they're going to announce some big things there. So be sure and, and be there. And that's it, Kevin. Oh, one minute early. Awesome. 
So um, if you want to learn more, um, this is definitely a bit of a high level thing looking at uh, the basic features and more importantly, a good model for you to use to, to get value quickly when you're doing a virtual agent. Uh, but, you know, find us on LinkedIn uh, or visit our website. Uh, if you're interested in engaging, uh, please contact uh, us uh, by going to sales at fmxsolutions.com. One of our sales team be happy to talk to you and see how we can help you down this journey. Uh, even though it's not GA yet, we can always start having, you know, kind of pre-sales conversations about what you want to do and, and what that plan might look like for you if you're looking to roll this technology out at your organization. So uh, guys, I'm, I'm half of myself and my entire team at FMX Solutions. Thanks for taking the time to join us today. And as always, Kenzie, thank you so much for, for inviting me to present and for taking the time to set all this up for us. Thanks, thanks so much. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks everyone for joining.